So I thought this was fantastic. Um, they've got a new generation of wind power, and that's it. It's a floating dirigible that has a windmill inside it. And the point is that the wind is much stronger, about a thousand feet off the ground. So they can uh, take this someplace out in the country, like at the North Pole or something, where you don't have any power station or lines. They can float this thing up and get some power from it. And the wires holding it, it up are also the conducting wires to bring the power back down. So that looks pretty awesome. And this I thought was pretty fantastic. A big issue here is global warming, of course. Now we're going to have tons of global warming and uh, nobody thinks we can possibly stop using fossil fuels soon enough to actually avoid heating up the planet a whole lot. So after we stop adding more carbon dioxide to the air, which hopefully will happen in a decade or two, we're then going to have to clean out of the carbon dioxide that's in there. And this book is about the proposals to do that. And these proposals are pretty terrifying and horrible, like this one. You want to ship, there was a volcano eruption about 150 years ago that caused night and dark skies around the whole world for like a year. So they're going to um, try to create that again by putting a million tons of sulfur dioxide each year into the air to uh, reflect the heat of the sun back into space. And it'll keep coming down, so you have to keep putting more out there. And this will create uh, horrible side effects, like parts of the world where they you don't get enough sun to grow crops and people die and god knows how much pollution from all this acid rain coming down from that or something but anyway this is the kind of plans they have i know another one was to dump incredible amounts of iron in the ocean to stimulate algae growth to fixate the carbon i know but we're going to be into some of this that's why i'm one of the um one of the uh tech advice column for career advice said that if you want a real career, you should focus in carbon fixation technology. There are various plans. There's other ones where you do some kind of chemical reaction to suck the carbon out of the air, and then you pump whatever you created down in some mine and fill it up. So, you know, these are, uh, but we're definitely going to be in for that. Um, many people are trying to develop carbon fixation. I think Elon Musk just declared a $100 million prize for anybody who invents an efficient, uh, cheap enough form of carbon fixation. It is one of the big problems of our time. Anyway, a fifth Senate Republican just declared retirement. And I was glad to see this analysis that said this does mean just what I think it means. A bunch of them just can't stand Trump and they can't stand what he's doing to the party. And they keep hoping that Trump is going to take a hike. And now they have given up hope. It is clear that Trump is going to continue to dominate the Republicans. And these are the ones who have been sort of opposing Trump's stuff. And there's no point staying a Republican in politics if you don't love Trump. So they're retiring, and we'll see what comes of this. Um, this is uh, this is a tough thing, and I think there's an interview with Lindsey Graham that just came out that's very informative. He said, look, I'm trying to make a deal with Trump so he doesn't destroy the party. I know he's crazy. I know some of his ideas are really problematic, but if he splits off and forms a third party, he'll destroy the Republicans. So if I can somehow control Trump and prevent him from doing the worst thing, I'll be able to save the Republican Party. That's what Lindsey Graham is trying to do. Anyway, the idea of terraforming Mars by nuking it, yeah, similar thing. Anyway, so we're, we're living through some drastic change in the Republican Party, and Trump is making it clear that he's not letting go. And the voters are making it clear that it's either Trump or nobody. So the old Republican Party, before Trump, everybody might as well just quit if they want that. And this is something that I've been worried about for years. I've been hearing about this. Because of Brexit, this means Northern Ireland can no longer trade with Europe without there being trade barriers and such. And they are very upset. And now they have renounced the Good Friday Agreement. And this is one of the big things people worried about Brexit. It might reignite the Irish problems, the huge terrorism between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland and Britain huge unrest up there. Very, for decades, war and, and terrorism and battles back and forth between the Protestants and the Catholics in Ireland. And Brexit kind of destabilizes that situation. It was just recently brought into some stability. So this may, uh, may lead to big trouble. Um, Rob Graham, is a frequent commenter on InfoSec issues. And he, like a whole lot of people, are really mad at the New York Times. 
Um, they feel very strongly that New York Times information security articles are very sloppy on the facts. Will you be using the Secure Web Apps textbook in the future? Um, yes, probably. I don't know, maybe another version of it, but I'll use it in CNET 129S. Sure, it is the uh, it is the Bible in that. Yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so anyway, he, he claims that they they have things that are wrong and they don't fix them. Like for example, they claim that Eternal Blue. This has been. Um, a big thing in the New York Times, and in particular Nicole Perlroth, very much wants to claim that the NSA is causing the cybersecurity by holding on to zero days and, and turning them into weapons and then losing them and having them used against us. That is a, that's certainly, I think, not an insane position to hold, but that's very much the position she pushes and the New York Times pushes. And Rob Graham doesn't agree at all. And he says, for example, she blames Eternal Blue for the Baltimore ransomware attack, but that was not true. It was not Eternal Blue that did that attack. However, what Rob doesn't mention, it was Eternal Blue that did the earlier attack, um, not Petya, which brought down hospitals in Britain and nearly here. So, you know, anyway, but he said this is why he thinks the New York Times is acting like Fox News, where they have a sort of agenda to push and they'll sort of blur over or falsify the facts as needed to line up with their agenda. It's, it's anyway, it's a worthy thing. That's why I put it in my news article. It's, it's a worthy position to read. Um, and uh, this one I thought was great. This parrot beat Harvard students at um, Three Card Monty, where you have the cups and you try to find where the thing moves. This parrot has a better memory than humans. So uh, I'm not too surprised by that, but some people might be. I mean, animals are sometimes smart and they might have certain abilities that exceed ours. Um, anyway, NFTs, I'm hearing a lot about these things. Um, I heard about this maybe three years ago. This is one of the many blockchain ideas. And the idea is if you want to assert ownership of some kind of digital thing, like you record a song, an MP3, you can somehow record the fact that you wrote the song on a blockchain and now you have some kind of proof. Now, as usual, the thing that seems completely pointless to me is that you don't need a blockchain for any of this. We've had this for yeah, decades and centuries in America. It's called copyright, and all you have to do is prove that you had this object before other people had it. And the typical way you do it is you put it on something and mail it to yourself and don't open the envelope, and then you have a postmark, and you can go into court and say, I was the originator, here I am, having it on this date, and whoever had it on a later date copied it from me. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, Jimmy's asking about that book, Secure Web Apps. Well, I'll use the latest version. If they come up with a later edition, then I'll, I'll use that. Anyway, um, so anyway, that's what these NFTs are. You can now take any kind of digital property, like a rock song or something, and you can make some kind of digital record of who owns it, and then you can sell it. And Jack, the uh, owner of Twitter, made an NFT of his first tweet. So it can be owned by somebody and sold it for like $200,000 or something. So um, anyway, you can make any kind of digital activity into a sort of trading card. And people are trying to pretend this will be the next big thing. Um, like everything else about Bitcoin and blockchain, it, it is a solution in search of a problem. The only reason why Bitcoin has any value is money laundering. Yeah, as far as I can tell. Other than that, there is nothing it does that you can't do cheaper and better with ordinary money. But anyway... Um, so there are colleges always in trouble over accreditation and the accrediting council for independent colleges is pretty notable. It, this is an incredibly corrupt, unjust process, as I found out by watching the college go through it. But this is pretty impressive. These guys actually finally got kicked out of the ability to accredit colleges because they had been accrediting colleges, including they accredited a college which was completely fake. They accredited a college that had no teachers, no students, and no classes. And when you get accredited, that means people can take federal grant money, uh, federal education funds to go there. So there is some limit of corruption that's even too much for them. Anyway, so here we are. This is 127. And uh, today it is format strings. So we're down here to format strings. And it's heap overflows next week. So let me bring up the slides. Just looking for comments, okay. And uh, I'm pretty much going to be just demonstrating the main format string project here, and then I'll show you, I think, uh, race conditions too. 
is my plan after that. So here's format strings. Format strings, like almost everything in this class, this is a problem caused by C. And C just has a lot of strange features as language. And this is the fundamental problem with everything in this course. Your RAM just contains bytes, zeros and ones, and it does not contain any information about what those bytes are. So it, there's, it could be an integer, a character, uh, part of an instruction, part of an address, part of a string, an MP3, a movie. It's all just a string of bytes, and nowhere is it stored what that byte is supposed to be. So we can put in something that's text and have it reinterpreted later as executable code or something. So the format string is what's used to tell C how you want to interpret this stuff. Um, okay. Uh, the audio, go to get the audio from Twitch. Anyway, um, so here is a program where you have an integer and a character, A equals 65, and so on. And when you print it, you can print the same thing. Like here's a character, A equals 65, and you can print that as percent %C. Um, and so here's integers printed different ways. Um, you print the same integer, which is 1001. You print it as a percent decimal, which we'll use as many places as necessary. A percent 5D, which will print it five spaces long, so it adds an extra space at the start. Percent X will print it um, as, I expected to see a hexadecimal number, but anyway, here it's printing as 3E9. Um, here's character A, and here's a pointer, percent P. So you tell it with these format strings, like D and C and P, you tell it how you want to present the data. And often you can present the same data several different ways. But you can also do this. You can print format strings only, percent %x, percent %x, percent %x, which means hexadecimal with not a specified length, and then no variables to print. And instead of giving you an error message and saying you forgot to include the variable, it just prints out some data. And it is not obvious at all what this data is. And that's the heart of format string vulnerabilities. And it comes from the way that C works and from the way assembler works. You push arguments on the stack, then you call the subroutine. So when you get into the print argument, in the print subroutine, it does not know whether you properly prepared the stack or not. It just assumes the stack will contain the arguments I need. So it looks on the stack and finds the format string, and then whatever comes after that on the stack, it just assumes those must be the arguments. And if, they, if the programmer forgot to put arguments on the stack, it will just print whatever it finds on the stack. All right. And the most important ones for us are percent %x for hexadecimal, and you can pad it out to any length you want. That's one of them. And the other one is percent %n, which we'll talk more about later. So here's what happens. If I make, this is buffer overflow, right? I declare a name with room for 10 characters, and then I put in more than 10 characters. C will just do it without complaining, and it will cause a buffer overflow, which we've already exploited in the previous classes. Here, this is another stupid thing. Print something with a format string, but you didn't tell me what to print. Again, in a sensible language like Visual Basic, it would just give you an error message, but C just does it. So this is an information disclosure vulnerability where you can um, read memory that the programmer did not intend for you to see. So here is a format string controlled by the user. I call this program with an argument, and that argument is used and printed without a format string. So if I give it something like hello, it will just print hello. But if I give it a format string, it will interpret this first argument as a format string and then print stuff off the stack. And if I use percent %n, it will then crash. So now, here I had a information disclosure vulnerability, and here I have a denial of service vulnerability. So I would like to turn this into an arbitrary code execution vulnerability, and that's, of course, the point of this course is exploit development, taking crashes and turning them into remote code execution. So percent %x reads words from the stack, 32-bit words for the 32-bit programs we're doing here, Percent %n writes to the stack. It writes to this address. Percent %n is a very strange format, and it will write to the RAM locations it finds on the stack. Hello, if you, I'll, I'll type it in here. I'll go to um, 
Twitch. Perhaps I shouldn't even be opening uh, Zoom anymore. All Zoom seems to do is uh, get people to go there. Anyway, all right. I think that's what I'll do. I think I'll just close this. Well, I guess I better not now. In the future. Anyway, so, um, all right. Anyway, um, hopefully that'll do. All right, so, present n prints the number of characters printed so far to a memory location pointed to by the parameter. And as far as I, I was never able to think of what this is good for. I looked and finally found a Stack Overflow article where they said this might be useful to format the output on the screen, to space things out. Anyway, this means I can write to RAM locations, any RAM location um, controlled by the pointer. So uh, this affects all these functions that are related to printf, like sprintf that prints to strings and these other ones. <coughs> all right. Um, so if you want to prevent these things, then uh, stack defenses won't do anything. The canary value at the end of the stack won't do anything because I'm not filling the buffer and hitting the end of the stack frame like we do. I'm just writing directly to a chosen location in RAM. And uh, all right. I just see there's only eight people in Twitch. Makes me wonder if something's gone wrong here. But I shall charge ahead. Anyway, address space layout randomization just randomizes where the stack is. But again, that doesn't matter because I'm writing right to an address I choose. Non-executable doesn't really matter either, although it might make it, both these might make it a little tougher to find code I've injected, but they don't stop the fundamental weakness. Um, but a static code analysis tool is the obvious thing. Just look at your source code and look for a print statement that has no uh, variable. 15 in Twitch, OK, it only shows 8 for me. Good, I'm glad you can see it. Twitch is very strange. Doesn't seem very accurate what I see on the screen at all. Anyway, good. So uh, GCC will warn you about these format strings, but it won't, um, it won't stop you from using them. <coughs> I'm not even sure it's going to warn you in this case. So here's the exploitation. So what I have is I have the ability to write to memory, and I want to take over the box with that. So I control the write operation. I have to find a RAM location that will control execution, and then write four bytes, give me a 32-bit address there, then I have to insert shell code somewhere, find the shell code, and put that address in the target RAM location. Those are the steps. So we're just going to do it. So here's a program. Let me bring up my, uh, uh, looks like, yeah, this will work. OK. So here's my, all right. They're giving me nonsense. OK. All right. All right, let's make it bigger. OK, so if I cat ed204.c, then you'll see here I've got that program, same one you saw before. It's going to take an argument on the command line, and it's going to copy it into this variable called buff, which, by the way, only has 1,024, so there could be a buffer overflow if you put in more than 1,000, but that's not what I care about here. And then it's just going to print that without a format string. So if I run that and I give it A, it prints A. Um, computer problems. Um, yes, let me see if I can get these people to go to Twitch. Um, I seem to be uh, somehow. All right. All right. All right. Anyway, um, so the, uh, all right. And if I put in a format string, percent %x, then I get a number printed out. And that number is whatever the next number on the stack is. And if I put in percent, um, D. That's percent X. And uh, all right. So this work, it's percent N, right? Just a moment. I want to get there. Uh, all right, percent N. 
All right, percent n, not listen, there we go. All right, and if I put a few percent n, so let's see if it'll work. Yeah, so now I get a segmentation fault. So what's happening here is when I wrote once to memory, it didn't cause a crash, but when I wrote several times to memory, it caused a crash. And if I want to know why, I can put a few percent x's here. And I'll see what's going on here. The first value here, FFF, as we'll see later, that's actually in the stack, so I could write there. But these others write to foolish places, including this one, which is probably the one that made it crash. Eventually, one of these hit an invalid address, and that's what caused the segmentation fault. So the percent %n tries to write to this address. The percent %x just puts out this address. All right. So that's the essence of the vulnerability. And also, um, you could notice here that this 252E7825, that looks kind of like ASCII characters. That is percent %x period. 252E78. Um, and you can find that out by putting in AAAA right there at the start of this. So if I put in something I can spot, like AAAA, then I can see the 41's there. So the characters I put here appear as the fourth element on the stack. So now, by putting characters here, I can control the fourth element. So if I put a percent %n as the fourth operation, I can write to this location. So now I know I can write, and I know I can control the address I'm writing to. We're getting there. All right. And uh, sometimes it's much further down the stack for more complicated programs, but for this simple one, it's only the um, third, a fourth element on the stack. So now, where do you write to get control of the EIP? Um, you could, in principle, write to the saved return address at the end of the stack, and then it would be like a buffer overflow. You could write to the global offset table that points to library functions, like we've done before. You could write to the destructors table or C library hooks. There's quite a few places you can write an address that will eventually control the instruction pointer. And I guess we haven't done the global offset table yet in this class, and that's the one we're going to do. There's also something called at exit, which is called when the program ends. You could also find a function pointer somewhere. And when we get to Windows in a couple of weeks, we'll start hitting the exception handler. So when you trigger an exception, that will take over the instruction pointer. Anyway, so let's take a look at the GDB here. Well, you can just see it here. If you, if you just disassemble it, you'll see it calls printf. This is where the format string vulnerability is. And after that, it calls exit when the program is leaving. So that's all we really need. It calls this C library function, and I wish to let that call continue without destroying it, because I'm going to exploit that. But if I change the address for exit, then when it calls exit, it's going to call my code. So what you do is you use objdump minus r to find the relocation records. And um, those show you the procedure linkage table and the global offset table, which are used to reach libraries. So it shows you the dynamic relocation records. And it shows you this simple program doesn't use very many C library functions, but it does use exit, and that's stored at this address. So it jumps to this address, which contains a, a address which is used to go find exit. So all I have to do is change that address, and I will get control of the instruction pointer. So you can do that right here with that run command. Let me bring this down here. OK, so if I run the debugger on my program, all right, it's not listening to me, 204. All right, and now I can run. Uh, so let's examine that thing. Uh, 0x, 0804, A014. All right, that's the pointer that leads to exit, and it's nicely labeled for me there. Now, I have to do this run, which is why I'm trying to fit them both on the screen at once, because that's kind of a drag to type. So run. And the dollars, quote, let's be put in these things the way I would in Python. 14 A0 0 4 0 8 Okay. 
And now, percent %x, percent %x, percent %x, percent %n. There. If I've done it right, yes, it works. And I can tell because of the 1b there. This put that address, little endian, 0804A014, which is this address. It put that address onto the stack in the fourth location. It then printed three values from the stack, and then it wrote to that address. And if I examine that address, it's now got 0001B. So I took the correct value, which is this 804 stuff, which points to a real C library, and replaced it by 1B, which goes nowhere good and causes the program to crash. So I've now been able to target a value, which eventually ends up in the instruction pointer. The only problem is the data I put in that value is useless. It's an invalid data, so I'm not able to actually run code yet. But we do control the EIP. So now you can write one byte there with this kind of exploit. Um, and that, that's what will happen. And you can then change this last value, 18, and write four bytes at a time. So it's 14, 15, 16, 17. You run it four times and you write one byte each time. So if you do that, you're going to get um, 37.3f, 47.4f. So it's about time to talk about what value it's writing there. The value it's writing there is equal to the total number of characters that have been printed so far by the program. That's why it goes up by 8 each time. So if I control the length of these x's here, I can control the byte it writes there. And so um, that's why you make a chosen value here. You're going to have to keep rolling it around. 256, you use a percent, a number, x percent, um, percent number x. Remember, percent 8x is 8 bytes long. Percent x is unspecified. I could make percent 300x, and that would be a hexadecimal thing 300 bytes long. So I can make these things as long as they have to be, and I can multiply them by a factor of 256 to make the lower byte roll around to zero. So this way I can write one byte to this location, plus perhaps some higher bytes that I don't care about, and then one byte here and one byte here and one byte here. So I have four of these format strings in a row. I can write four times. So there'll be 4% ends in here. And it will slowly write four bytes into these locations that I want to write into, and then it will do some extra collateral damage to other bytes outside there, but I don't really care. That's how this works, and that is F2, and you can see it go. So if I run this, all right, I start it from the beginning. Now you see it ran, it printed these long strings, and it now created A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D in the instruction pointer, not that Comenius value. This is still an invalid value that still causes a crash, but it's just a dummy value. Now I can write anything I want in there because those are here. So now I need to choose a better location to write. And so the next thing is to put in the shell code. I'm going, since I'm already putting stuff on the stack, would you mind moving the terminal screen right a bit, okay? Oh, why, thank you. It's cutting off. Good. Thank you for telling me. All right. Anyway, um, all right. Good. So the next thing is to put in shell code. So this stuff is appearing on the stack. So what I can do is I can just add a not sled and shell code at the end. So I'm going to use, thanks for telling me, I'll use 90s, 190s to make a not sled and then 250 cc's to be dummy shell code. Now cc is just break. As soon as it hits the cc's it will break. I'm just putting it in there so I can tell if I have execution. And this is f3.py. Now the problem is um, I won't be able to see this. Oh, well, let's just try running this one. So I ran f2. If I run f3, OK, and start it again. <coughs> it runs. It prints all this junk, and then it crashes. And now, if I examine the stack with ESP, then here it is. 
So you see, now I can see where the NOPs are. Here's the NOP sled. Here's the dummy shell code containing CCs. So now I can pick an address. All I need to do is pick any address in the NOPs. And that's the address to write. So um, any of these addresses would do. All right. And now I can make an exploit, which is F4, that will do that. So um, anything in the range of FFFF D09C would work. So let me bring up my other window so I don't have to keep leaving the debugger. And OK, let's make this bigger. Um, OK. One twenty seven. Okay, let's get this up here. All right, so um, now if I okay, F four cat F four. All right, so what I did was I wrote F F F F D zero A C. That's the address. Let's take a look at that F F F F D zero A C right there. Okay, so this is in the NOP sled. Doesn't matter which one you choose, although it can't. The address cannot contain a null or it would break the string. So this F4 program is the one that does that. So let's run that one. F4. All right. So I run that one. Now it does not crash. It makes it to a breakpoint trap, which means it made it through to the CC. So uh, I know it worked. It hit the knobs, it slid down the knobs, and it hit the brakes. So, and I can even see FD0D5. If I go back up here, D0D5, CCD0D4, there. It executed this command at D4 and broke, and the next instruction pointer is D5. So it did just what I thought. It slid down some of these knobs and hit the brakes. So now I know many things. I know I control the instruction pointer. I know I can insert code and find it. And I know that my code will execute, because these knobs are perfectly valid commands, and they executed. And the CC was a perfectly valid command, and it executed. If I had non-executable stack here, this would not have executed. So. Uh, now all I need to do is two more things. I need to test for bad characters. I mentioned before I can't have nulls or they would break the string. And often these other characters will also break the string since it's being inserted in a command line um, command, name of the program, space, parameter. Then you know if you know the bash uh, command line that spaces separate command and character and line feed and tabs will all do it. So if I, uh, this is the bad dot pi program, which will print out just a series of bytes to put them on the stack. The rest of it's the same, but then it just prints out a whole series of everything from 1 to 256, skipping those characters. And the question is, do they all end up in memory? And you can tell by putting a breakpoint in. So let me do this. If I quit doing this thing and I put a breakpoint in so that I can stop it, all right, something bad is happening. Oh, quit anyway. No. OK, I put a breakpoint in. All right, now I want to run bad dot pi. All right, and now it hits the breakpoint. And now I just want to look at the ESP. So that should be up here. There we are. All right. And so here's the NOP sled. And now instead of putting in a shell code, I put in a series of bytes. Here's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Then I skipped 9 and 10. And then B, C, I skipped D, E, and F. So on it goes. And you can see 25, 35, 45. So 85, D5, E5, F5. And then F6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, F, F. So all those characters went in to memory. If any of them had been bad characters that break the string, then the ones after them would not have gone in. So um, all right. So that now I know how to avoid bad characters. 
And so now I can generate shell code. And you just do it with MSF Venom after you install Metasploit. And you tell it what you want. This is going to be a shell bind. And you list the bad characters, null, 9, A, D, and 20. And that'll just create the hex characters you need to generate that shell code. So inserting that in the program will now give you a shell. So um, I'm able to see that shell, and that would be, I think, F5. So if I run that, and we run it, uh, if now I, I put a breakpoint so I can examine the memory before I execute the memory. And so here's the NOPS, and this random looking stuff, that's the Metasploit shellcode. So it looks like it's laid up correctly. And if I just continue, it will now not crash at all, but exit normally. And if you go to another command line and do ss minus pant, you will see that it's now listening on port 4444. So that's what you want. It's listening on 4444, so anybody that connects there will get a shell and be able to control your machine. So that's the whole exploit, adding a few things we haven't done before in this class, like um, how to insert shell code and how to test for bad characters. All right, so let me try some cahoots, uh, which I should have here. All right. And that's this one. All right. Waiting, I can try to answer this question. Yeah. Um. Maybe that's enough. All right, let's see what this does. All right, what's percent D? All right, that's a number. Yeah, a decimal number, in fact. How about percent N? Yep, it writes to RAM, an spectacularly dangerous thing to do. 
How about percent P? All right, that's a pointer, good. All right, so how do you catch these format string bugs? Yeah, none of them will stop it. All right, what happens when you exit? All right, and it calls the destructors. All right. All right. All right. 